Welcome back to Hot Flashes and Cool Topics podcast, the voice for women in midlife and beyond. Here at Hot Flashes and Cool Topics, we talk about anything and everything to do with midlife. My name is Colleen. My name is Bridget. Mm -hmm. We have Dr. Luann Brizendine on the show who recently written The Upgrade, How the Female Brain Gets Stronger and Better in Midlife and Beyond. So guys, we're not getting worse in our brains. We're getting better, Bridget. Like, yes. Because her first book was called The Female Brain, and it just went crazy. Like, you know, it was a New York Times bestseller. And this next book, she feels that menopause and perimenopause terms are obsolete. And we really should be calling it a time of upgrade. That's why she titled the book The Upgrade. And so we talked to her about how She has found that as we get a little older, we don't really want to cater to the needs of others as much as we did in our 20s and 30s, and that the actual, the change in ratio between estrogen and progesterone makes us more direct and less wanting to put up with BS. So that's all Mm -hmm. positives, don't you think? I believe it is. I do. And I mean, you know, there's a time and a place to have that, you know, all those hormones there for your nurturing or whatever it is that you need at that time but it's a reward. It is something we've earned. And so I love the way she looks at everything. And, you know, both of her books, I've read The Female Brain, and then I've read The Upgrade. And it's so interesting how she talks to couples and things that they're going through. And just what people do, you know, as they get older and, and different situations and how women are feeling this power at this time. I just really enjoyed that. It seems to be a running theme in a lot of the people we talk to. And even, you know, whether they be experts or just like us, regular midlife mm-hmm. women, that need to please seems to diminish with time. Yeah. They need to be a people pleaser. And I'm all for that. Hey, you know what? <laughs> You don't have time for it anymore. (laughs) Oh, man. Yeah. She also talks about ways to fend off dementia, to increase longevity. So the book is really fascinating. And we're going to talk all about the book. But before we get to that, we just have a couple of things we want to bring up to you. Number one, if you would like to watch this video, we are partners now with VitalC.com, B-I-T-A-L-C-Y.com. And all of our videos will be up on there. And VitalC is a website right now that is focused on what we call the peak stage of life, which is us. And they have just added Vital Sea Travel. So we're really excited about this because they are offering cruises with some amazing partnerships and they're going to have their own onboard concierge. They're going to have special guest speakers. Maybe you might see Bridget and I one day. Exclusive excursions and special pricing. And they have ones coming up for Alaska, Tahiti, Costa Rica. I mean, it's just great. So if you go on Vital C, you will not only catch all our videos from this particular interview and some other ones, but you'll also be able to check out Vital C Travel. And, and we love to travel. And now that the world's opening up a little bit, why wouldn't you want to travel with a bunch of like-minded, energetic midlifers like us? Yeah. <laughs> and also exciting is that it is almost Mother's Day, ladies. And you know us, we could not go through Mother's Day without having a large bundle giveaway. So we are excited to announce our Mother's Day giveaway bundle with over $700 in products with five or six different brands. We are going to have a full line from State of Menopause. We have tinctures and powders from Wild Women. Hot Girls Pearls has a gorgeous blue lapis pearl necklace and bracelet. They're like $160. They've put it into the package. We're going to have a gift card from Genev Telehealth health. So you can sit and talk to one of their telehealth experts, Bossa bars, which are energy bars created just for midlife women. And we now have a line of merchandise for hot flashes and cool topics podcast. We're so excited. And we are throwing in there a t-shirt that says, who says we want to be younger because really who says we want to be younger. So in order to enter, it's super easy. Just go to our website, hotflashescooltopics.com. You will see the way to enter there. Just click on the link and you may be a lucky winner. The drawing will be on mother's day. So you have lots of time to enter. Let your friends know about it because it's going to be a Mother's Day bundle that every mom would want to get, right, Bridget? Yes, every mom deserves it, but only one can win. So make sure you go to our website and enter. Yes, exactly. So with that being said, we hope you guys are having a great week and we are going to talk about your brains with Dr. Luann Brizendine. So welcome back to Hot Flashes and Cool Topics. Today we have on Dr. Luann Brizendine. 
who is an American scientist. She's a neuropsychiatrist, a professor, and a New York Times bestseller of the female brain. And you have a new book that just came out. It's called The Upgrade, and I'm showing it for our video people. And how the female brain gets stronger and better in midlife and beyond. And you are talking our language in this book. So welcome. Thanks so much for having me on Hot Flashes and Cool Topics. I love your title. It's so good. It's so good. I know the upgrade, the upgrade sounds good too, but so we're going to get these women upgraded here. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's right in line. You know, that word upgrade was like, yeah. And the freedoms that we have at this time. Colleen, you always talk about the freedoms that we gain mm -hmm. in midlife. Yeah, Absolutely. Because they are, we've earned them. They're privileges that we have earned. And I think your book really points to a lot of that. And the first thing I loved about your book is that you kind of changed the wording for perimenopause and menopause, and you wanted to completely change the wording to the transition and then the upgrade. So can you talk a little bit about why you did not want to use the terms perimenopause and menopause? So, you know, the terms, they're kind of old terms and they're terms that are very, you know, pejorative and negative. They've taken on such a negative connotation to all of us personally in the culture, et cetera. And so I wanted to use the word transition because it's a more neutral word, but it's also very much more descriptive about in some of the ways we're going through that transition. As you do the transition into puberty, this is like puberty in reverse. You do the transition out of the menstrual cycle. And then, of course, the word menopause is that just that technical word that basically means the it's only a one day menopause lasts for one day technically because it's you've had by definition 12 months without a menstrual cycle and on that day that's your one year then you're in menopause and then all of a sudden you're in post menopause the next day so it's a negative word but it doesn't have much meaning so then the upgrade is really where you are after you finish the rock and roll of the ups and downs of the menstrual cycle and there's freedom on the other side Exactly. And, you know, you talk about just these differences in the rewiring, what happens in your brain and all the nurturing that you feel when you're a mom and a female. And I know in your first book, you talked about mirroring other people. And then there's that change after that. Can you talk a little bit about the neurological changes that happen in that transition? <laughs> So, you know, actually the female brain is very interesting because we learn to do kind of emotional mirroring of helpless infants. And, you know, Mother Nature, we are very wired for that. Our great, great, great grandmothers, they were very good at that because they survived and their infants survived. So that never really goes away, that ability to hear the tone of voice of somebody else and match their facial expressions and to know what they're feeling. So that's pretty much by the time we get to the transition is hardwired in us. So that's, that's not going anywhere. But what happens with the menstrual cycle hormones and the up and down of the estrogen, progesterone and the hormones of pregnancy and, you know, I like to call it pup calls, you know, when our kids want us or when they need something or what, you know, we kind of learn to have a special ear for that around the house when they're there, unless they're teenagers. And then they go into that rabbit hole where they don't speak to us for a lot of time. But anyway, we'll talk about that later. And it, the, <laughs> the transition and into the upgrade, you're basically unplugging a bit from all of the hormones that run that circuitry almost in overdrive all of the years that we're, you know, raising kids, having babies and that kind of stuff. So all of a sudden we have a little space. We have a breathing space, ladies, a breathing space where we can kind of get back to, you know, some of the things that we want to do for ourselves. And so many women think that when they start that transition to become more self-reflective, that it's somehow selfish because we have spent so many decades putting ourselves last on the list. How can women reconcile that need to kind of put themselves first with the outdated needs to not be selfish? I think there's many aspects to that. And it's a work in progress for all of us. You know, it's like there's this breadcrumbs along that path. So for example, we all know that when we're happier inside ourselves and we're doing more self-care, then we have more to give to others. So I think that's a real basic foundational principle that we all recognize or come to know that that's really the foundation of where we want to be. We need to do enough self-care, self-love, things for ourselves in order to fill up to be able to give to others. And, you know, with that principle in this transition, it's that you're not having to only take care of 
little infants, little kids. I mean, it's a whole different, what's on your plate for the day is not the survival of whether you're going to be breastfeeding an infant or not. You're out of that phase and you're into another phase where you may be able to give love and care to other people in enormous ways, but you have to fill yourself up first in order to give to others. So I think that that is a transition that happens and a knowledge, a self-knowledge and wisdom that we women get at that stage and have internally. So I think that word selfish should just go out the window with this transition because it's really building a, a better you in order to be able to be nurturing and caring of other people. Yeah, I think that getting rid of that word and also just letting just the public realize, I think they still expect women, especially mothers, to still be this, oh, I'll do, okay, I'm gonna stop what I'm doing first. Uh, you know, and do whatever for you. And they still think that, I think, for older women. But I think with this coming along with acknowledging that it's not selfish, I think it's starting to get better, I think, for women. I hope it is. <laughs> and, and Bridget, I have another thing on that. You know, anybody that's got late teenagers or get into early 20s or whatever, kind of like the, how do you parent or mother an adult child? Well, first of all, they don't want you in their business. <laughs> They don't want you. They tolerate us. They tolerate us, but they don't really want us in their business. So I like that phrase, detach with love. Mm -hmm. You're it's giving them term. the dignity, the dignity and respect of having and managing their own lives without having you in there meddling. And they appreciate that. So I love the phrase kind of learning to detach with love, which you can do at this stage. You know, part of your book, and it's a little further on when you're talking about the tent of me, you do talk about relationships with your adult children, especially when they have either some type of addiction or mental health issue. And it was fascinating the way you talked about connecting the nervous systems. They almost become like interdependent. Can you talk about that? Because I think a lot of people go, why do you put the child who has an addiction first beyond everybody else? And you explain it in a way that really kind of was an aha. You know that, you know, we do have our, our nervous systems are entwined with the people that we love. And, you know, they are entwined and they're really interlaced in a way that you wouldn't want to pull them apart. So they're interlaced in terms of, you know, how you read the little signs that they need something from you or don't. And let's say that you have an adult child that has an addiction or has a mental illness or has, you know, other physical medical issues where they're not going to jump into a totally independent adulthood. Okay. That is one of the toughest lines to walk for us mothers, I think, because they in many ways are adult, but in many ways they still need you as if they were still a child and they have lapses in what we, judgment. But you know, you also want to let them make a few of the mistakes themselves because if you're always there scooping them up, they're not going to learn anything. So I think it has to be very adjusted for each kid, you know, each adult child and parent. And it's constantly being reconfigured, that interlacing of our nervous systems. But we moms are on alert, even with our adult children and especially those who are having troubles. We love them so much. We would just like to fix everything and have everything be, you know, okay. We want them to just be happy. Okay. That's the given in all of our hearts, right? You know, that's where our hearts are. However, you know, we have to learn to know when something is kind of like a 911 call from them versus just when they're feeling uncomfortable and how much discomfort, you know, they need to solve some of their own problems. So that's that kind of like deciding how interlaced that you are with your nervous systems with those. Colleen, you may have had something else in mind too. No, just, I mean, that was pretty much what you were saying is that I never thought about being interconnected with my nervous system with my child, but it makes sense when you think of that way. And then you talk about taking small steps to disconnect. So what would you say for a parent who feels like they can't find any joy when their child is suffering and they do want to try to make some space there? What would be the first or one or two steps you would suggest? That's a perfect question, Colleen, about just how when you are so interlaced in your nervous system with a suffering adult child and that you feel 
that their misery is your misery. And it's like this 100% mirroring of their misery in your own nervous system and you are miserable. I think the first thing to do is to recognize that. You allow that to be there and to feel what that's feeling like with you, which is usually pretty miserable. It's awful feeling because you're feeling all of their misery. And then there's a level, the next step is that, okay, you accept, you come to an acceptance of the fact that they are miserable and that that is also making you miserable and that that interlacing of your nervous systems is there. And then you're able to then just take the reality of that and to feel like, okay, you come to some piece of wisdom because you realize that you can't go on like that because you're not going to have anything to give because you're being completely drained so that you are going to have to move to a place of self-care where you're detaching with love a bit from that person and that you're having some of your own space. You have to be able to regain a bit of your, your own space by either, you know, becoming closer to your religious community, by becoming closer to your girlfriends and going out and doing things with, that make you happy. Maybe you really enjoy playing tennis or you enjoy going on walks with friends or going to coffee, but making sure that that is on your dance card every day, something for you. So that would be the first, I would say, first step. A lot of it has to come with an acceptance and acknowledgement that that is what's going on. And then that the solution is because you can't go on like that, you need to take steps to do self-care and fill yourself up. Do you feel like that part of doing this is easier? And I know typically adult children, typically you will be someone who has transitioned already, but sometimes you're not. Sometimes you've got women that are younger and they have adult children. Have you found, or do you know if it's easier for a woman once she's gone through that transition or is it easier before they go through that? Tra like Colleen, <laughs> Colleen has not gone through that transition yet. So, but well, I, I call it the revolving door. It happens yeah. and then it comes. Then yeah. It yeah. <laughs> yeah. The reason Bridget, I think that it's easier sometimes as you've gone through the transition and you're in the upgrade is because you're not having that continuous roller coaster of the hormones coming back and then dropping out and then missing a period or two and then coming back. So it's sort of jerking your own nervous system around. And so what I do for women often like that is that we kind of say, okay, you know, this so-called transition stage slash perimenopause lasts between two and nine years. We don't know how long it's going to last for you, but let's take a plan of action with it and look at the list of what things we can try. So we can try, I often try just putting women at that stage for 18 months to 24 months, just having them be on a continuous birth control pill that keeps the hormones very level and balanced so you don't get jerked around up and down. So that's one very easy technique that lots of doctors are, you know, they're familiar with and can use. And then some women in the transition may just need a little bit more estrogen as they go through different stages. So that's another thing you can do as you go through that. I mean, it'll just help anything that can support your nervous system by 20 or 30 percent is actually a big deal to helping you be able to just you know, deal with the ups and downs of dealing with teen or adult children, which are, you know, it's like you're hormonal, they're hormonal. It's like a little bit of a, it's like a little nightmare there. Yes. <laughs> the perfect storm is they say. It is. Yes. I think when you were explaining the transition in the book to the upgrade, and I do love that terminology because it gives it a positive light on, okay, you've gone through the transition. Now you're upgrading your life a little bit. And it's a much better term than postmenopausal because then you just sound a little older, you know what I'm saying? You're but one of the terms you use, and I actually wrote it down because you were explaining waves and how waves are one of the most powerful and efficient physical forces in existence. And if you visualize a wave coming in and out, that's what your hormones are doing. So when women question, why am I behaving this way? You know, the next moment you could be behaving a different way. It's great to visualize that, to say, okay, my hormones are coming in a wave right now. And you actually go out of your way in the book to say, I validate that for you. And I don't think women hear that enough. 
that you are validated in the fact that your body is not doing what it used to do. Can you talk a little bit about that waves analogy or metaphor? So it's great to kind of like, actually, you know how it stands feeling you're standing in the ocean where the waves are pushing you or pulling you. And you know, it's that, so that's why I wanted to make it almost, it's a physical, you can get the physical feeling of it, right? It's a, it's a metaphor, but you can really feel what it feels like to have being pushed and pulled by those waves. And that's what your hormones are doing inside your body. Remember the purpose of a hormone is to cause a behavior or cause a certain emotional state. But I think, as I say, I think God, when she made that, when she made the perimenopause, she kind of messed up there. <laughs> we could definitely use a little easier waves there. But I, so it's very important to realize that the hormones will push you and pull you during those years because I don't know how technical you guys want me to get here, but when the ovary is starting to lose its follicles and not make as much estrogen as we go along towards losing all the follicles in that perimenopause and the transition to the upgrade, there's some months when, because the pituitary is like yelling at the ovary, please make more estrogen, we're not getting enough up here. Like, and then all of a sudden the ovary squeezes out a huge amount of it, just kind of like in response to that demand. And you can have 10 times more estrogen that cycle than you're used to having before. So it goes up very high. And that can be like kind of a screeching feeling like, ah, you know, fingernails on the chalkboard. And then it drops really quickly. And you will have cycles where you won't even ovulate at all, which means that you're not going to have any progesterone that month. And that, like I talked about in the book, sometimes when you don't have ovulation, the lining of your uterus gets built up really heavy. And then you have one of those periods where you're flooding all over the place. I mean, you know, you're, you can't even walk out of the house without changing your pants or like, you know, basically you need a depends plus an extra super maxi pad. You need the, you need the whole nine yards. In there. Yeah. In there. <laughs> and, and a super tampon, you know, oh, super yeah. tampon, the maxi pads, you, know, you need uh, everything. Yeah, everything. You don't dare white, nothing in white, nothing. Never. In, no. I no. only wear black, <laughs> only wear black <laughs> bottoms. You know? Yes. <laughs> You know yeah. that, Colleen, right? That, oh, yes. Oh. I think, you know, uh, Bridget and I talk about obviously menopause, or uh, should I say the transition and the, the upgrade, upgrade yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, all the time. And Bridget went through a lot of very heavy cycles when she was going through. And I'm just now three months, no cycles. And I have found that my body has calmed from it. That's great. That I, I don't have the migraines as often. Now, granted, I'll get off this, you know, interview and I'll have a flash period or something, you know, with my luck. <laughs> yeah. But it, every, it's interesting that every woman's experience is so different. It is. And I think it's why it's hard to talk about too, because like, even like, not only is every woman's experience different than another woman's, each of our experiences may be different every single month. I mean, it's it, you know, if, if we're going to talk about what it's quote unquote like for us, well, what it was like last month and what's going to be like next month, how do I know? I mean, I mean, stuff that I hear about from my girlfriends about how they're going through theirs or they're not, they may be fine this month. And then I hear from them a month and a half later that they're a complete wreck, you know, and women used to come into my office and say, look, Dr. Brizendine, I just feel like if I didn't have a husband and kids or whatever, I just, the joy has gone out of my life. I just, don't, you know, I just don't feel the, you know, I, I, I've lost hope. And, you know, it's, you know, there, it's a very, can be a very depressed feeling, not all the time, but during the transition, there can be those. So I think we need to honor the fact that it's really, really tough for a lot of women. It's very tough for a lot of women. It is. And then when you're in a marriage and if you're in a marriage or if you have a partner and a spouse, that trying to deal with their reaction to you. Okay. I, I mean, and for every woman, it's different. But I know for me personally, libido went bleh, like just down. And I, I know that you talk about that in your book, The Female Brain as well. And can you talk a little bit about how you maybe can talk with women about those situations? Uh, definitely. And I did, you know, the, the libido changes are, I don't know it's, if you guys find it too, but it's like, it's something women don't talk about with each other that much. I mean, it's, you know, we'll mention it a little bit, but in our culture, it's considered that, you know, if you don't have a sex drive, if you're not, you know, if you're not, you don't want to do it anymore, you sort of keep that to yourself. Cause if you're, 
married to a guy. <laughs> it's like, you know, it, it, you know, the libido in males is always at the same, if you're the same age, they always have three times the libido that we have on average. You know, this, it varies for some women, of course, but it's about three times more all during those years of, you know, of 20s, 30s, 40s. And then along comes the transition. Oh my God, because then ours can drop into the basement. And it's kind of like, don't touch me. Don't come near me with that thing. You know, just, I, you know, don't even think about it. And it's really hard on a marriage because sex for us women and sex for men and this these are big generalizations so i don't mean to anybody that doesn't fit in this category just but you know sex for men if you're not having sex with the man in your life he gets this delusion that you don't love him and it really really can cause havoc in a relationship because well you know, when you don't have any more testosterone, you don't have any more of the hormones that cause interest in sex. And, you know, we have that big surge of interest in sex a couple of days between, before ovulation when we're in our cycling years, which is that, that's how mother nature made it so we would want to get pregnant. You know, I mean, it's, it's like, you know, that's your sex drive. At any rate, it's not happening anymore because you're not ovulating and there's not the amount of testosterone you used to have. So that libido can kind of go flat and you have to start learning some different things in your sex life. And you have to start, you know, every woman, every woman, it's like, I feel like every woman feels like she's kind of on her own to figure it out and not to have her marriage fall apart. Because you do see that a lot. Don't you? Right. And I think yeah. you have the example of a couple in the first book and then actually do a follow-up in this book, which is really kind of sweet that because they got divorced and then they got back together, but they didn't get remarried, which yeah. we also see just in conversations a lot. Women don't have, you know, it's like once we're past that reproduction age, a lot of women who get divorced don't have a strong urge to get remarried, but men seem to do that. Is that also neurologically well, they, want, they want a caretaker, you know? <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just saying. <laughs> no, no, I've but... seen that. I've seen that so much. Yeah. Yeah. And they, mm -hmm. they, they and that, that's where the phrase nurse with, they want a nurse with a purse. With a purse. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Nurse with a purse. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, that's, I like that phrase. That's a good Southern phrase, you know? It whatever. is a great phrase. But your yeah. grandmother said, don't find one of those guys who just wants a nurse with a purse. <laughs> <laughs> and, and now for me, I mean, I've been married 30 years and I love my husband. And, but I did, I said to him, I've just seen different situations. I said, I think if something happens to you, I am not getting married again. And I, because I've seen the second wife has to take care of the, she came in, they're married 10 years and then the, the guy's real sick. And then they're having to be the nurse with the purse. And know? that's like, kind of what happened in the follow-up to yeah, the relationship yeah. story from the female brain. Yeah, that's Robert we, and Sylvia. That's, I never yeah. I never use real people's names, but we called them Robert and Sylvia in, in the female brain at the end of that, the end that yeah. chapter, we called the mature female brain. And then they, yeah. So they had a very interesting, I just kind of followed them along and they got back together because they really, whatever they, the things that clicked before still clicked, et cetera. But, you know, he was quite a bit older and, He's, you know, she didn't want to get remarried. She just wanted to, whatever. I guess she she had struggled so hard for her freedom before that she felt mm. like, gosh. And it is so true what you said, Colleen, about the, you know, the earlier fertility years are a time when getting, being married and having kind of that, you know, all the things that come with that as a nest for raising children. And it's just a, it's true. I mean, it's like that that's what kids need. Kids, kids need that kind of safety and security. And we women, we, you know, we, we recognize it in spades and that we are a species that have very helpless children until they're at least three or four years old. And we can't do it all by ourselves. We need help. We need, you know, we need someone to help quote unquote, supply the nest as they say, or at least, you know, mm -hmm. be in there, you know? And so I think that after that though, coming into the upgrade, uh, it's not, and it's not an essential. There are a lot of women who do want to get remarried if they've gotten divorced. There are a lot of women who get divorced during this phase. I, I was so shocked to read the statistics of how many women in their late 50s and at 60 are getting divorces. So, you know, it's a, it's a thing. <laughs> All right.
it, it's it's surprising, but it's I I understand. I mean, I'm not I, John's going to listen to this. I'm like, no, no, John, I don't want a divorce. But I I've seen it. I've seen it in my family. I you know siblings, and it it is just kind of like I'm done with this, and I'm ready to do something else now. But it is interesting the story about the couple that did get back together too. But I see what that happened because a lot of women they like the woman went out with other people and then thought, Hey, I don't really like this person either. <laughs> I've seen that happen. A lot. I think a lot of it too, a lot of women just are people in general, like to have someone to do things with, to go places with. And I, I've Companion. seen that compare. I've seen my mother-in-law, the same thing. She just said she dated someone else. He passed away. And she said, you know, I just didn't know how much I'd miss him just to go to a movie with or, go out with so I think that's something else that might I think companionship is a human need we all have it's like and you know that whole epidemic of loneliness right loneliness is a big epidemic and that's horrible for your mental health so I think that the the issue of marriage versus companionship versus whatever you need to do to build your path onward into the upgrade is something that and to you know be learning to check in with the wisdom of yourself about what that means for you and like like we're talking about with Colleen saying like in the book I talk about the tent of me how you know we you're you're assessing what that is and how you can be your best person and I think that um it's I thank you for bringing up the issue of that word selfishness that we're going to ban that word because if you build up the tent of me and your all, all of the good things that you have in you you have more to give to others why is it, you know, in, in this section of the book that you talk about the tent of me, you also talk about the importance of community as we start to go through the upgrade. Why is it that community plays such an important role underneath that tent? I think, you know, there's there's all these great studies that show that women who have at least, you know, four times a week, they have something with their girlfriends. That's you know, girlfriend time that they their mental health is much, much better. And ongoing, their mental health is much, much better. And I think that all of us really during the pandemic have experienced that in spades. I mean, it's like, it's been, you know, especially the girlfriend networks are, um, I know one of mine has kind of maintained itself. We we went to our, our Saturday lunch, it turned up being on Zoom for a while and whatever. And then we returned to when you can eat outdoors at the place. Anyway, so, but it's, that is a real meaningful mental health for women as we age and it at any stage of course but it's also you get you share information just think of how much you, when you, you know like when i needed an electrician last week and i didn't have one i called up my friend marty and she was you know immediately she had her got whatever you know it's just these little things that are part of what you can share with each other how to live your life better and community is just critical for all of us and we need to nurture it just like a garden we got to water the garden we got to put some effort too. And I know a lot of women that's hard if they've gone through a big change, if a spouse died or if, I don't know, if something else happened, they, they're no longer working. I know that happens to a lot of women around our age. They're starting to retire or they've been aged out. And I have seen that happen to people where even before the pandemic, where their community's getting smaller and they're not sure what to do next. That transition in your career or the aged out at your job or that, you know, I mean, the, the that's something that I think women start to look at when they hit 50, especially. That's kind of a time when it's the, the aging out starts to happen. And um, and also some women, I mean, it's it's time also to, to try and look at something new. But it's like, I, I really feel like it feels a little bit like society is giving up on you. And what I'm saying in this book is, don't give up on yourself because it just gets better and all the statistics that do the studies and how much what at age 20 the 20s the 30s the 40s the 50s they measure happiness how happy people are actually it's called the positivity effect and they don't really understand why it is but each decade people get happier and happier up and, and they've done it all up until up to the 90s so people report that they're happier so you got to stick around for the miracles, ladies. <laughs> yes, yeah. <laughs> and now, you know, along those lines, you also talk about wisdom as being a kind of double-edged sword that, you know, yes, we gain wisdom from every experience, but a lot of women don't want to step into the role of being the wise one. 
Can you talk a little bit about that, your thought process in the book about that? So, you know, I think for me at this point in my life, one of the biggest gifts I have is being able to use my wisdom to help younger people and pull, pull them along or to, or even just to, in a way, what I call wise listening. You know, I found that being patient and wise listening is really kind of one of the cornerstones of all of this. And I think that, you know, we don't have this honored place in our society for the wise ones, the elders, and, and that, that the family goes and consults the elders or consults the wise ones in the family. You know, it is that way in some cultures. There are other cultures in the world that do do that. And I think our culture has gotten more and more away from it with the kind of uh, fanatical youth culture that is, you know, basically that's the fanatical consumer youth culture that, you know, all the companies want those people to sell their products to. So there's a whole, there's a bunch of stuff about, you know, it's not, and now, but so stepping into your wisdom, Colleen, like you're asking, stepping into that and feeling comfortable stepping into that is a process. It just doesn't happen one day. It happens slowly, slowly, slowly with lots of interactions with different people. And just, I think, um, l allowing that to happen at its own pace, but knowing that you're moving towards this really important position in society and in your community of, you know, the, the wise woman position. That's interesting too, because, you know, there were so many times I read in your book that I was like, oh, that's important. I have to remember that. And one of those sentences that you had, and I'm going to read directly from the book, says the biggest benefit to having gone through some of those moments that bring us to our knees is learning the lesson of setting aside pride, which I think is so important because as we get older, we care less about what other people think about us, about failure, who cares? And so instead of saying, oh, well, you know, I don't want to be the wise one because that makes me old. It's saying, okay, I realize that I have to set aside my pride with that and just be, this is the role I'm in now. And that's, that's very powerful. I think for women in our demographic to really understand that mindset shift. Yeah. That the setting aside pride and become, becoming, having more humility um, is something that you get more humility from having those episodes in your life where you're brought to your knees you know, you don't, you, you realize you're not invincible. You realize you're not perfect and you're never going to be. And you realize that, you know, you're not going to just, that, that everything isn't going to be Pollyannish in your life, you know, no matter what. And you, you, you start to accept your wrinkles. You accept your, this, you set, accept your, accept your um, not being able to do things as fast as you used to. And I think that that's be, with humility and that, that, I mean, pride, pride is actually an awful thing. It is really poison to all of us. I mean, it's poison at any age. And I think when we're younger, we just don't realize it. I mean, it's, it's just so much a part of how we are. <laughs> but mm -hmm. as you get old, I think it's like that the pride, pride is pride can be very, it can make you stubborn and it's really poison to your relationships. It's poison to yourself. It's kind of, so I think as you move towards wisdom and more patience, and more humility, that, that letting go of pride, and also letting go about what other people think of you, Colleen. I think that was something you were um, kind of getting towards too. Like, like I love that phrase, what you think, what you think of me is none of my business. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I love that one. And you're not as inhibited. You might've been a person, like I'm a non-confrontational person that I might've just let something go but now if I see maybe something that's really an injustice, I might say something now, or I may not worry about what somebody else says where I wouldn't have said it 15 years ago. Absolutely, Bridget. I think we women, I mean, we, you know, being conflict avoidant is kind of part of the cornerstone, a lot of how you learn to be female and you're taught to be female in whatever. I mean, it's probably in all cultures, but just because we're, you know, whatever, we're, we're quote unquote, the weaker sex or whatever, you know, it's like, I don't know, it's just part of the culture and, and that learning to be conflict avoidant is something that is so wonderful as you go through the transition and into the upgrade, 
that you can kind of it's like a snake losing its skin. You can kind of lose the skin of that stuff of being conflict avoidant. It's not that you're just going to pick fights with everybody or whatever, but it's that you're going to, from your own heart of conviction about knowing something that was that was unjust or wrong, you can you know you can say something you can you can say something that you mean kindly, but not say it mean. Exactly. That's a and, great way of putting it. And yeah. no is a complete sentence. So. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> And Learning you do to mention, say no. That yes. is a big no, one. I, I used to write that up on my uh, sticky on my computer saying no is a complete sentence. <laughs> <laughs> and you really yeah. appreciate that as you get older, that it's okay to, you know, the okay, fear yeah. of missing out is, it just isn't there anymore. Mm -hmm. Don't, the fear is more of having to go out. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. It's like, oh God, do I really have to put myself together and go together? Exactly. <laughs> So I guess, you know, you talk about the three stages of the upgrade, the early, which is really starts the 12 month anniversary of no cycles to the middle to full upgrade. What does full upgrade for women look like? So full upgrade for women is when you've, you've passed through all those hormonal stages, whatever, and you've, you've hit, you've hit cruising altitude at a very you're in a smooth slipstream of cruising altitude where there's not all the bumps and and banging around of like hormonal stuff jiggling you each way and so you're physiologically in in, in a very uh, calmer place and not as anxious and and better able to focus on things or to choose not to focus like no is a complete sentence i mean you've You've learned some new tools. You've learned some new tools at that stage in the full upgrade to be able to be your authentic self, to be in a place where your convictions are something that you feel fully and you know when to step forward with saying something about something that's not right. So it's just completely where you're not necessarily being a people pleaser all the time anymore where you have also humility. It's not like you're being, you're not being Miss Smarty Pants, a wise woman. I mean, it's not going in that direction, but you're going in a direction where you're, you're openness. I mean, I said, one of the ways to solve any problems, I, I, I like the little acronym H-O-W. You do it with honesty, openness, and willingness. And you come at it and that full on upgrade, you're able to hear many different levels of things and be able to respond full heartedly in a way that is consistent with your own conviction. That's a great way, I think, to yes. um yeah. to end this. And we, you know, the book, The Upgrade, How the Female Brain Gets Stronger and Better in Midlife and Beyond. We we're speaking to our demographic. It came out April 19th. So make sure to check out this book and the female brain because that's kind of the beginning. And, and you wrote carriage. the male brain as well. <laughs> yeah. That was a yeah, pamphlet. Both, Bridget, that, that was, was a pamphlet. pamphlet. That was a pamphlet. <laughs> That's awesome. Oh, that That's was so fun. funny. Okay. <laughs> Dr. Brizendine, thank you so much for coming on the show. We really appreciate it. And we thank you for your time. My honor. And I hope that some of these things in the book will be helpful to your audience too. So oh, we're sure, sure they will. They will. Both sure they will. Delightful. Thank you so much for having me. Thank, thank you. you. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Brizendine, for being on our show today. It, it was really fun talking to you and just learning so much about the upgrade in this time of our life. It's so exciting to have people write about things to look forward to instead of reminiscing about how you wish you were younger or how you wish you could do things. It's so uplifting to just hear somebody talk about the joys that we have to look forward to in our future and just what she does uh, for women and just the encouragement that she gives. I just really appreciate it. And make sure you go out and get the upgrade because it was just released. So we're really excited to share that. And don't forget to go to vitalc.com to catch the video of this episode. And don't forget about our Mother's Day basket bundle full of all the great goodies in it. And make sure you go to our website, Hot Flashes cooltopics.com and enter to win that basket. Also check us out. Uh, we're on TikTok. We're on Instagram. And Bridget you know. has started our LTK shop. That's so right. you guys who don't know about LTK, we are dipping our toes into 
just working with some brands that we love that Bridget loves fashion and makeup. And so we've decided to kind of try out LTK. So if you go online, it's LTK.com, right, Bridget? It's LTK. I think it's shopltk.com, shopltk.com. And we're under Hot Flashes Cool Topics. So look for our, our little store and just things that Colleen and I like. Um, you know, if we bought a dress that we really like and we really want to share it with you or just anything from furnishings to products that we use um, that we might recommend. Um, if you go to your our site, you can or go to LTK shopltk.com, then you can get there and find just different things. And we'll be adding to it as we see fit. I might even be brave enough to put a photo of me in a bathing suit. Now, not that that's something anyone wants to see, oh, but I stop. did find a fabulous bathing suit I'm so excited about. So I will probably- Oh, I want to see that. that. Yeah. So now I'll start buying from your LTK week. Oh, that's thank right. you, Colleen. <laughs> <laughs> I won't have to shop anymore, but you definitely check that out. In addition to the brands we love page on our website, which we have just redesigned, it's launching this week and you are going to love some of the stuff there. We just want what midlife women to know there are products out there for us. And, you know, we are the average midlife women. We are not, you know, stick mm -hmm. figure, tall, former models. No one's are, ever called me that. Ever. <laughs> just say neither one of us we're both five four we're both yeah you know, we are we are just regular midlife women who say you know what if we knew about that we would buy it and if yeah. we say that we know it's something that we need to let you guys know about that so lots of fun things coming up and have a great week guys we will talk to you soon bye